While a number of Democratic senators voted against including the minimum wage increase, one decided to have a little bit of fun with it. And so here is Senator Kristen Sinema during the vote. Miss Sinema, Miss Sinema. There's just so much there in that couple of seconds. Now, look, realistically, her no vote is basically exactly as bad as all of the other no votes. They all had the same effect of contributing to it not being included. Um, but if what you're doing is telling, I think in her state, I think there's like close to 900,000 people um, working below that wage, that like, why are you having fun with it? Why are you doing like a parody of John McCain, who, as despicable as he generally was, when he did the thumbs down, it was to maintain the ACA at the very least. Why do that? Why do the little squad and have your bag as if you're just, oh God, I gotta do this before I leave? I don't understand why doing the fun performative thing on this of all votes. Yeah, so first, um, let's also point out that she brought chocolate cake in, in case we were unclear about the analogy. Uh, so she's the Marie Antoinette of the establishment. Let them have cake instead of higher wages. Well, we appreciate it, uh, Senator Cinema. That's very, very clear. And and John is exactly right in the word that he used. What you're seeing there is performative. Now you're thinking, well, who's she performing for? She claimed to be in favor of the $15 minimum wage before. Now she's making a giant showing of like, ha ha, I'm for lower wages and rubbing your face in it. But she's not like Marie Antoinette because Marie Antoinette was genuinely clueless. Cinema knows the positions, earlier touted the other position, and knows that she's going to get a lot of attention for rubbing our faces in her not being a, a real Democrat. Well, and that's your answer. So this entire performance, is virtue signaling or perhaps the opposite of virtue signaling for corporations. This is to raise her hand and say, I have no virtue. Just like Joe Manchin, just like the other six, but I'm gonna do a whole big show and tell over it. And so this is what judges do if, they try to, if they're right wingers and they're trying to get on the Supreme Court. They will rule that corporations can literally kill you. Kavanaugh ruled that and Gorsuch ruled that. And corporations make note of that. And so the Chamber of Commerce looks at that through the Federalist Society in the case of the courts and goes, "Oh, these are vicious, vicious anti-worker, pro-corporate people. Let's put them on the court. This is cinema raising her hand going, I will do anything for corporate donors, anything at all. And I'll have fun doing it. And, and, I'll, and I'll, so I'll be your huckleberry. And, and corporate donors notice that and go, oh, that's it, atta girl, okay, put, move her up the list. So maybe we'll run her for president or something. Because corporate donors ruled all of Washington. So that explains the mystery of why kick us when we're down. Because she's signaling to corporations, I'm the worst of the worst. So make sure you back me for my higher ambitions. I only have two points to add. One being that um, if we're working in Marie Antoinette analogies, I think it's uh, important to note that there is um, not a clean opinion among historians as to whether Marie Antoinette actually <laughs> said, let them eat cake. <laughs> and I think the record should reflect that. Um, she had a lot of very pronounced enemies, both in court and outside. And while she was an extremely privileged young woman who existed in court and was married off as um, effectively property and a political pawn, um, she, uh, I don't agree that she was necessarily clueless um, <laughs> while she was definitely not a class conscious person for sure. Sure. <laughs> um, having said that, <laughs> with regards to the performance on the floor, I, I I can't even put myself in that position. I I would listen to you know any sort of like statement she eventually gives after the fact, but I think mostly what that speaks to is just kind of like the insulation and entitlement that can often come yeah. from roles like this and this belief that you know even when you're being watched, you're not necessarily being watched in the way that other people are being watched, and so yeah. you have footage like that. Well, I I don't I'm sure she will make some kind of statement. I will say that she <laughs> tweeted earlier today uh, saying that she understands the hard choices that people have had to make during this pandemic. Um, well, maybe this was a hard choice for her, I don't know. Uh, and so she, one of the one of the things that's really confusing about this is, you know, she's tweeted 
like first of all, her own political history, she presented herself not that many years ago as like a radical progressive or whatever. And that apparently is a long way away now. But just like look at this tweet, a full time minimum wage earner makes less than 16k a year. This one's a no brainer. Tell Congress to raise the wage. That was seven years ago. And now she's in a position to actually do it. But I mean, going back even further, um, uh, journalist uh, Ida Chavez, she uh, re upped this 2002 letter that Kristen Cinema published in the Arizona Republic that says, until the average American realizes that capitalism damages her livelihood while augmenting the livelihoods of the wealthy, the almighty dollar will continue to rule. It certainly is not ruling in our favor. Which kind of gives me like vibes of Pete Buttigieg writing that thing about Bernie Sanders a billion years ago. And then, oh well, then once you're in power, it's slightly different, I guess. The one thing that I'll say that kind of loses me, and I only sort of kind of touch base with this on Twitter a little bit, is people who are like focusing on her bag, which we talked about it. And it's not a bag that, you know, lots of minimum wage people are gonna have, but it's not a $10,000 bag. Supposedly her bag's like 150 bucks. Every guy in that room is wearing a nine hundred to three thousand dollars suit, so I, I wouldn't want to focus too much on that. Like a good silk tie is eighty five bucks, and it's not practical in any way. So there's plenty that's obvious to focus on without focusing on her bag choice. I think. Yeah, I actually disagree. I uh, so I, I, I wanted to address her um, uh, the tweeted statement that went out with regard to you know individually I support this. I think especially coming off the research of doing this book. Um, I think that her use of the individualized narrative to talk about what she would or would not support and decisions she's made in her own life when confronted, you know, with these kinds of choices or these, they're not even choices, but like these exact realities, I think is very telling when you're talking about implementing systemic changes, like everybody having a $15 minimum wage and what that would do in terms of um, redistribution or rebalancing, you know, any sort of dynamics that are there. The fact that she's invoking a very personalized story to essentially eclipse that, I think, is very telling. As opposed, um, with regard to you know her politics, but also like how she is conceiving of this potential systemic change and what should be implemented to effectively eclipse it. And that is like this very these very personal choices, these very personal anecdotes, um, which should be a huge red flag when there are decisions like this that are coming up. Yeah, so um, I, I want to comment on what, what John said there. Also, what Koa said, I'm going to come back to that in a second. So, no, I actually think the bag and the and everything that's part of that performance is relevant, uh, only because I think she intended it to be relevant. So, the size of the bag is almost more important than the price of the bag. It's so. So if it was not part of a performance, I'd say get off her ass. Who cares what she's wearing or what bag she has? Who cares, who cares, who cares? But she's with the curtsy, with the cake, she's obviously making a giant point. And the point is change on the outs. And this Kristen Cinema 101, she's perfected this. Change on the outside, continuity on the inside. And she knows the media generally looks at the superficial. They're obsessed with the superficial. So the media will almost never criticize any of her votes because they'll say, well, that's not objective. Uh, people have lower wages, they have higher wages. I'm a reporter, I don't care at all. And so if you want to crush those, have the powerful crush the powerless, I'm neutral to that. So that's the ethos of journalism that I don't agree with, right? So called journalism. Uh, so, but she knows that. So she goes, now let me give you something else to talk about. I'm hip. I'm I'm young, I'm bold. Remember, because she was going for the radical thing. And to be fair to her, not immorally, but intellectually, she gets into Washington and she got there by being pitching herself as a radical progressive. That's smart because the majority of voters are progressive, and cinema knows that. Once she gets into power, she realizes, oh. No, it's the donors that make all the decisions and have all of the power. And if I want to remain as a senator and protect my incumbency, I have to serve corporations. And she correctly adapts, now this is removed from all morality, right? She adapts to the environment that she's in. And in that bubble too, here's the thing you might not know, but I have interactions with people inside that bubble. The bubble is super thick. And that bubble says progressives are irrelevant. They have no power at all. In fact, you will have more power 
if you kick a progressive on your way, just gratuitously. So cinema is is correctly assessing the situation and going, if I make a giant show out of being young and hip, they will tell all of their viewers and all of their readers, the media will, that I'm progressive. So that way I can get their trick them into their votes. And then I'll tell the donors, look at my votes. I voted with you guys and against my voters every time and I'll get their money. So she, in a sense, don't blame the the player, play, blame the game, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and that goes back to what Cole was saying about Marie Antoinette. At the end, it was not her power, it was the king's power, Louis the 16th. And then in this case, you could argue his mansion, but I would argue it's Joe Biden. And I and I would go beyond Joe Biden and say, no, it's actually the donors that control Biden, mansion, and cinema. They're King Louis the 16th. They're the ones tell, rewarding Chris's cinema for rubbing it in our face. And that's what she's reacting to. I will add that I think that I, I don't mean this um, specifically to cinema, but I think that progressive politics, quote unquote, however you're interpreting that across the spectrum of realities and issues, um, has in some ways been flattened into a brand, um, you know, for politicians, for celebrities, for famous people of all ilks, for Instagram influencers. Um, and so this ability, um, you know, kind of like what was said earlier, that you can signal these, you know, certain affiliations uh, while clearly voting them down, you know, in the same reality or or, you know, not extending any sort of legislative support or funding, or you know, depending on what we're talking about abstractly. Um, I think that an unfortunate um, uh, development that's happened probably in the last like eight, seven ish years, depending on which part of the country that you're looking at, and then like what parts of our culture is that you know some progressive tenants have become very trendy, um, and and they're trendy in such a way that they're not substantiated with votes. It's more so about you know optics and how you appear, and then like kind of like what you know was just being said about being able to signal to certain newsrooms that like you represent these values. Um, and I don't think it's isolated to politics, unfortunately. I think it's leaked out to a bunch of other industries as well as you know, branding has become very pertinent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I'm gonna say one couple of last things about that because that's such a great point by Kaw. So um, it basically cinema is saying, I think the media is stupid and will help me, okay? Um, because if I go with the trendy brand of progressive, and they never tell anyone that I'm not actually progressive, and you know, and I act the right way, I'm trendy in both directions. And I, you know, the media basically works for corporate Democrats and are dupes, so there's going to be no consequences, and my voters are never going to find out. Um, and it's a tremendous insult to the media. Who usually just sits there and takes it, uh, and and one of our members just wrote in. We do the show with you guys. I love being interactive with you guys. Jean Jenny uh, wrote in. It's all about publicity. Cinema, like the others, thrive on any attention. And so, you're Jean. You're right. Um, she's clearly trying to get attention here. That's why I talked about the size of the bag. Um, it's it's like when Matt Gates came in with that ridiculous suit, right, and looked like some sort of <laughs> mafia uh, capo, right? And so it, it was a way of saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. So why would she want to draw attention to this terrible vote? Because she thinks there are no downsides. She's drawing attention uh, to her being a moderate, which the media rewards, and to corporate donors saying, I, I'll definitely do whatever you tell me to do. Which by the way, again, let's just be clear, she's just being more ostentatious about it, is true for 90% of politicians. And so the ones that made it clear here today, that's why we got the petition, tyt.com slash petitions slash the hateful eight. That's the eight Democrats that voted against um, uh, the minimum wage increase and then rubbed it in our face and, and basically mocked us as cinema did and hence the title. Plus, it was a good movie. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun, but you also get 
playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.